I'm hitting the blue go live button. And we're live. It is Monday, September 27th, 2021, 5 o'clock p.m. Eastern time on the dot. Um, we are not allowed to have fun anymore, but we are allowed to have Ross Chite and pickle juice. Uh, and very happy to have you on the show. Uh, Ross is a professor of political science and international affairs at Brown University, my alma mater. Um, and we have been chatting um, on Twitter for a while. And I finally uh, wrangled him into coming on. He is coming off a hundred mile bike ride. So everyone has to be, actually it was like more than that. It was a little bonus. You did like a little over a hundred. Um, very impressive. How long did it take you? Like, yeah, um, I want to know that too. Six hours, 45 minutes. Oh, so you were you were cooking. But I was solo. There was nobody to draft off of. It would have been, you know, I should have been able to do it in five and a half. That's a good pace, though. I am I I put a lot of time into the bike. What kind of bike do you have? Um, A Trek Dumani. Oh, nice. That's um, nice. Yeah, I have a very unused cyclocross bike that I bought, uh, like a number, really nice bike a couple of years ago when I was into cyclocross and then like moved to New York and never <laughs> haven't used it very much. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, I am really excited to talk to you because we have, I was, we kind of were discussing uh, before, like a whole bunch of stuff that um, is of interest. Um, ben, where do you want to start? Well, uh, why don't we start uh, uh, with um, uh, uh, what you teach and and sort of give a little mm. introduction to yourself. The the subjects that you work on are remarkably diverse. Yeah, uh, what it's kind what of amazing. binds them together? Yeah, um, if in I your mind brings... only. <laughs> right. Um, well, I'll tell you what I, te I, I teach a range of courses and I've been at Brown my whole career, which is unusual. Wait, really? Yes. I came that in 1986. It was my first job. It was a great job and I've stayed. Um, I love that place. Yeah, it's it, you know, and the students are really what make it great. So um, I've taught the intro to public policy. So that's where I had. Um, you know, uh, um, Andrew Yang and um, Bobby Jindal. Um, Jeff, Jeff Levy was giving me grief the other day. He said, if we could come up with one other failed presidential candidate that you taught, there'd be a <laughs> legitimate story here, you know? I don't know. Did you have Seth Magaziner? He's been on the show. He's a friend of mine. We went to um, I def Seth. Yeah, I did have Seth, but, uh, but we're saying He's running failed. for governor. But he hasn't run for so president. And yeah, he hasn't run right. for president yet. Yeah. Right. He's yeah. oh, I've had yeah. Um, so I've taught the intro to public policy. I've taught children and public policy. I've taught ethics. I guess most of all, I've taught ethics and public policy my whole career. Um, most recently, I taught the politics of food, and that's where the Fish Project came out of teaching the politics of food and sort of realizing that people that write about the politics of food don't tend to write about fish. Yeah. So yeah. let's. So that's interesting. You got into uh, so I have a long-standing uh, weird obsession with fisheries that oh, dates good. from my years writing editorials for the Washington Post, and um, where I was mainly the legal affairs editorial writer. And uh, but the person who did the environmental editorials really just thought of it as a land-based project. Um, mm. And so I had, if it involved the environment and water, it s somehow fell into my subject matter. And there were, it was around the time that, you know, the Panetta Commission produced the, that Oceans Report. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of interesting stuff going on in, in the fisheries world. And so I got interested in fisheries and I've sort of stayed interested in it over the years, though I never write about it and don't do anything with it. You're uh, working on a book about fish and fisheries. Uh, talk to us about it. What, I am. what are you working on? Um, I'm trying to bring the politics back in. I guess I feel like um, you could read a lot of things 
is about the decline of ground fish in New England and nothing political happens. There's this whole, this happened and then this happened and then this happened. And, and it makes sense. Most of the people who engage fisheries are scientists right. and they don't really like politics. They don't, they don't think about it and they, and they don't want it to drive the system. And, and so they kind of, it comes in occasionally. Um, but I think it's underappreciated how, how much, what the politics are of fisheries management. So okay. that's so one piece. I'm, I'm going to pause you for yeah. a second yeah. and just say, all right, there are a lot of people in the audience right now who are scratching their heads and saying, what the fuck are they talking about? Um, <laughs> why? Uh, what is the the uh, and so I'm just going to say um, uh, for everybody who's expressing confusion or skepticism <laughs> in the audience. Um, the politics of fisheries and man fisheries management is a subject of intense uh, uh, concern to both environmentalists and to many local communities around the country. They're from subsistence fishing villages in Alaska to uh, uh, places along the Northeast coast, like Gloucester, Massachusetts, and, and lots of places in, uh, and Port Judith and, and Point Judith in, in Rhode Island, where, uh, and places in Connecticut as well, that are, the communities are very, very dependent in a way that you kind of associate with like Midwestern farmers and corn on fishing as a harvest. Uh, it's also true in the mid-Atlantic. Think about the, 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 the Chesapeake crab population and the people who uh, depend on that. And the management- there, It's a lot of like commons management uh, also. It's a lot of different approaches to managing common space. And because water is typically subject to a different series of jurisdictional constraints or lack of constraints or rules as or standards, um, all of those things kind of in a mix. Um, I think that, you know, Chesapeake, sorry, you said Chesapeake Bay, and I was specifically thinking the example I teach um, in my property law class about how uh, how the either side of the Chesapeake Bay had two different structures for managing fishing. Do you know about this story, Rob? Yeah, so the, I mean, one of the, the, the piece I'm spending the most time on right now is the federalism piece. So uh, yeah. Ben, I think a lot of people who've written about this think about federal waters, right. and they focus on nymphs and NOAA, and yet half the fish are caught in state waters. And, and the notion that each state governs its own state waters, but we also have these interstate compacts, um, and those are really interesting, and I think get way less attention than the federal issues. And, you know, the there's a lot of federal waters, but still the state waters for certain species are much more important. So, yeah, and um, there are, and there are uh, areas, uh, particularly in, uh, in the northern coast regions uh, on, on the, in the Great Lakes, where the principal authorities are state authorities, and those actually yes. involve substantial, uh, uh, substantial populations, um, and so uh, the the basic um, the basic message to people who are scratching their heads about this is: do not underestimate fisheries as an issue for the communities that they matter to. Those communities tend to have disproportionate political power um, uh, or disproportionate solicitude from members of Congress and senators. And so there's a, uh, a, a very complicated political dynamic that in, at the federal level, and I'm sure at lots of different state levels uh, involving this stuff. So, Although there is at the federal level, you know, we've had the farm block was very powerful for a long time. And one of my puzzles is sort of why we've never had as powerful of a fish block. And we haven't. And I think it's partly because the species are so diverse. And then, the, you know, the tuna people think anything that will help the salmon people will hurt them. I mean, there's a kind of it's really hard to get people together 
on issues about fisheries. So one really interesting question to me is why certain regions do fisheries management well and yeah. other regions don't. Yeah, this is so, one of the great stories with the Chesapeake Bay and the oysters. So, so our region is a disaster. Yeah. You know, we um, uh, oysters in the Chesapeake, crabs in the Chesapeake, um, the general health of the Chesapeake. And yet we're surrounded by the Chesapeake is surrounded by three relatively progressive states, um, Maryland, Virginia, Delaware, and relatively environmentally conscious. You go up to Alaska, yeah, um, which is famously not environmentally conscious. Uh, they have, um, you know, a resource extraction economy and their fisheries management is excellent. Um, and yeah. so I'm interested in like they don't have they're not fishing to extinction in in Alaska waters. So my question is, what is really the determinant of good fisheries management? What are the political conditions that um, that lead to it? It's not left right environmentalist versus industry. It's what is it? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm still working out a general answer, but I certainly have an answer for Alaska. I mean, Alaska, part of the answer is is the topography, which is they don't have they don't have the kinds of things that are degrading the water the way that uh, the Chesapeake does. You know, so um, the the sort of dispersed population, but also they have really prioritized the employment benefits of fisheries and have taken steps to prevent consolidation, which I think is really interesting. So an economist would probably tell you that in fact it's not very efficient. That in fact if you consolidated you'd get more efficient outcomes in and maybe cheaper fish, but fewer people would be employed. And they've made the absolute the clear decision in Alaska that employment's more important. Now there is a funny thing in Alaska, which is they're very anti-aquaculture. They have actually banned aquaculture, and it's probably a mistake. It's, and, but it's the, the view of commercial fishermen that aquaculture competes with them. And it's not clear that it actually directly competes, but they actually, by state well, statute, have salmon. banned aquaculture. Well, can we? Can you just yeah. define really quickly aquaculture and how it differs just really quickly? Yeah, and also, aquaculture if you don't being mind, farming. Yeah aquaculture okay. being um, some method of penned or some kind of farming fish. And when you're talking fishing, yeah. are you talking just fish or are you like, are you looking at everything from shellfish to, to, I mean, I guess shellfish and crab, sh crabs are also shellfish, but like shellfish and kind of other kind of mollusks. Yeah. Um, or are you just looking at kind of traditional fish? No, I'm looking at all of them because part of the impetus, I mean, part of the book will be about management and part of it's about food policy. So for food policy, it really like, what do we eat? And of course it turns out most of the seafood we eat is imported. So most, most of what we eat is not um, produced here. Um, and I think there is an interesting puzzle about why seafood isn't more popular in this country. Um. We, most high seafood consumption countries have a lot of um, shoreline. We have a short, lot of shoreline, and we are not a high seafood consumption co country. And in some way, why isn't chip, fish and chips more popular? You know, we have a lot of things that really came over from England, and fish and chips is intensely popular in Britain, and, and it never took off in this country the way you might think it would. So I, I mean, I'm like, so is warm beer. Sorry? But, like, I think warm beer is very popular in England too. And, like, I don't really think, like, I don't know if they're like some type of standard we want to hold ourselves to. So I, but, like, I have an aquaculture question. Yeah. Like, so when, when I, when people talk about fish farming, environmentalists get very, uh, agitated um, and yeah. they actually have a bit of a coalition with the wild fish uh, yes. catch people because aquaculture involves a lot of fish waste, a lot of food waste, all clouding in one uh, penned area. It's not so great for the places in which it happens. Uh, by contrast, mollusk farming, hmm. uh, oysters, yeah. Shell, clams, etc. Mussels. 
muscles really, really good for whatever yeah. beds it happens in because these are straining. Uh, uh, they're filters. Right. They're filtering right. uh, uh, mollusks, and they're really, really good for ecosystems. Um, why isn't there a more active public policy pushing aquaculture toward mollusks and oh, away no, from shrimp question. and salmon? And yeah, I feel like Michael. I, I'd Pollan say two reasons. Actually said a lot about that. Two reasons. One reason: it, the people that want to um, farm salmon, there's you know, there's much more money in that. Salmon's more valuable. Um, people like salmon more too. You know, mollusks are not as popular. But the really they important point, and this heart. goes to my book. The really important point is there's opposition. You know, so there's all there's often this question like, why aren't we doing more aquaculture? And the answer in this country is because people who live on the coast don't want it. You know, there's there's NIMBY opposition to it. And there was just a long article in the Providence Journal where somebody's trying to add an, an oyster farm in Tiverton, and the people the neighbors are all up in arms and they're all saying, We don't hate oystering, we just don't want it here. You Why? Know? And what what's the what's there's the a sense that it doesn't look on... right, there's a sense that it might not smell good. I think it's an overreaction, but there's always the same way that Cape Wind had enormous opposition from the people in Nantucket, yeah. you know, who thought their view would be ruined. There's a lot of opposition to aquaculture. So I think the politically, it's hard to do it in this country because it's it's it borders along people who have very expensive coastal property. Yeah, I think that so one of the it, the interesting thing um, and we've talked I was spent the first the year of the first year of the pandemic mm -hmm. in Wellfleet um, in Cape Cod yeah. uh, had a very active like fishing and mostly yeah. shell fishing uh, population. And the land management around um, commercial beds is oh, yeah. incredibly intense and incredibly valuable. It takes, there's like a 22 year waiting list to get a commercial license and a, and a, and a commercial um, bed. It's so, so carefully guarded and managed. Um, and yet, like during the pandemic, one of the things that happened was that there was no restaurant industry that people were like buying takeout and buying yeah. like and doing. So what they weren't doing is going out and ordering a big plate of oysters or something. No one, you know, and it was um, it was devastating to to that economy. Um, so when I had was mentioning oysters before and like Chesapeake Bay, I'm one reminded that there was like the oyster wars between oh, like yeah. Maryland yeah. and yeah. Virginia. Yeah. And I just put a link to that before in the chat um, from Wikipedia, but oh, which is a fun read uh, just to say Not how to like, be confused with the cod wars between the UK and Iceland. Yes, exactly. Yes, very good. So just to speak of politicizing fish, um, but the, uh, but the reason that I teach the um, what uh, the kind of the management of the Chesapeake Bay and oysters is because Virginia and Maryland ended up creating completely different management systems uh, to manage the commons um, after there was a huge problem with pollution, and one was much more successful than the other. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm look, trying to look at my teaching notes and remind myself which one it was. But I don't know if you can remember, but I remember it basically being that the one in which it was not kind of top down regulated, but was instead kind of re regulated by industry worked better. Um, but I forget which one did that. I mean, you probably remember more than I do. Um, that could be Maryland. So, I think it well, was Maryland. Back to Wellfleet, um, Massachusetts has this wonderful, not just federalism, there's local regulation. There are shellfish constables. Yes. I know. I have I've had a shell fishing. I've had a shell fishing license since I had to have one when I was yeah. twelve years old. Yeah. And they come around at low tide when you're out there with your bucket, and they check your license, and they take your name, and they run. They like check your take a gauge, and they check your um, check the size of the things that you're taking. I mostly get cohogs, so I'm like not really doing oysters. But um, yeah, 
it's a it's a it's a whole it's a whole thing and they didn't have people they don't, they're running out of people to do that job and there's a whole kind of yeah so it's a very interesting i mean on the eastern shore uh there is a huge culture among just local kids what they call chicken necking um and uh chicken necking you know it goes on a lot of the summer and what you do is you take a uh a fishing rod with a chicken neck on it and you just <laughs> dangle it in the water i mean then like kids do this for you know family food and uh they do it and the crabs come and try to get the chicken neck and then you just reach in and grab them and it's a um it's a whole local thing both in in eastern shore maryland and virginia um uh you know there's still a uh, local community in both states that you know does kind of it's not subsistence because they they do yeah. lots of they have lots of other food too but it's a seasonal you know kind of combined recreational and food source activity uh, that you know people grow up doing. Well, the political piece that that wasn't included in your earlier description is the um, importance of wreck fishermen and the oh, increasing yeah. power of this of recreational and and that's often the conflict um let me stop this sorry between um no, okay. the between commercial and recreational the, and the recreational interests tend to get um much more concentrated at the state level they're really effective at getting at, at getting onto those commissions. And so there are really interesting conflicts over things like red snapper between how the states in the Gulf want to manage it and how the feds want to. And the feds yeah, so are walk more us, attuned. Walk us through that. What's the uh, well the as, feds are more as somebody who really wants to go and buy a lot of red snapper and eat it. Yeah. I am just totally on the side of the commercial people on this. How are the wreck people getting in my way? Um, they're getting the concert, the, the um, conservation, uh, coastal conservation association is the name of the group that started in Texas and it's wreck fishermen. And one of the things they'll do, I mean, in several, in many of the Gulf states, they've gotten some fish designated game fish. So if you can get it designated a game fish, the commercial people can't catch it. That's kind of the ultimate thing. They have not done that with red snapper, but what they've got is an allocation now where I think it's 5149. Um, and but what you raise bed is perfect because the you know the commercial people get criticized, and their answer always is we're the ones who are supplying restaurants. If you want to eat this stuff in a restaurant, that's where it comes from. Um, and they always cast the, the recreational people as people who own million dollar boats, you know, who are really pretty wealthy to begin with um, and who are engaging in this activity that they enjoy and, and eat the fish. Um, but I think that the, the conflicts between rec and commercial, particularly just over what the allocation is. And yeah, this is, and again, also, if you get to the also, fisheries management people, they go, well, that's a political question. We have nothing to say about that. But also if you're like... Also, who do you think from the taking point of view are the good guys, right? So the wreck people say, hey, we want a pristine ecosystem so right. we can go out there and catch a huge one, right? And the commercial people say, I think with some justice, we're the repeat players. If this fishing no. stock is depleted, we're out of business. So we're the ones with the interest actually in the maximum take that's consistent with long-term sustainable fisheries management. And I think there's a, there's a really interesting question as to who actually represent, better represents the public interest. Uh, I agree, but I do think commercial fishermen have over time shifted from one species to another, or they fish something out and they adjust. Yeah. So that, you know, that kind of cuts against the idea that they're trying to always protect and, and um, and conserve what they're fishing because they've depends, certainly fished it, out a lot of things. Absolutely right. I mean, and they they have a tendency also to think that they um, think that they know what's sustainable and be wrong. 
And so, like, yeah. that's what happened to cod in the North Atlantic, right? You had relatively stable catches over time in both the United States and Canada. And then it just dropped off a cliff to near extinct. It's starting to come back now, but it's but only just starting. Yeah, no. And that and we'll call that, you know, nymphs will call that a success as long as it's improving at all. Whereas historically, you've gone so far down that it's it's a little hard for me to call some of those species successes, which yeah. they'll call sustainable as long as it's come up a little bit um, over time. But now, Kate, you know what this all proves? This is like, it proves that the um, fish project is the opposite of the child abuse project. Yeah, we were about to pivot to that. We it is, because the, here's what I say is that you, like people love to talk about the fish project. It lights people up. Everyone has something yeah, to say. Yeah, you're great at dinner parties. Like uh -huh. And the child really abuse project is the exact parties. opposite. Well, it's all exploitation. We, uh, One is exploitation of a natural resource, and the other is child <laughs> sexual exploitation. I don't so, know if you want to like make it like just kind of reduce it to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we leave fishing, I will yes. tell the story of um, my young how like how fish got me into politics at a very young age when oh, I was cool. in, when I was in third grade. I went to Park Road Elementary School um, that had a, um, it was in a, it was in Powder Mill Park, which was like the small state park. And there was a fish hatchery for rainbow trout. Oh, because there excellent. was a beautiful, like, and one of the things that I would do with my family was like, go and feed, you could like go and get some food and you would feed the baby rainbow trout and you kind of see them. And they released yep. them into the stream for wreck fishing, basically. Yep. Yep. Um, and there was an article in the paper when I was like in third or fourth grade, I can't remember. Um, and I read it and it was like, they're going to go out of business. They're going to close the fish hatchery. And so I took like a tin can and I went door to door in my little like 60 house neighborhood, like collecting like nickels and quarters for like, and raised $75 and 46 cents, which I was like, sure was going to save the fish save hatchery. The hatchery. Wow. <laughs> and, like, um, but actually then like the, the, like my, my fourth grade teacher, like, basic i think like told the principal we did a huge field trip and it all got covered by the paper and they ended up not closing the fish hatchery because of my like 75 dollar and 36 amount of like attention that i anyways i don't know actually what happened i have no idea and i've never looked it up because well one of the interesting mind. things about fish hatcheries <laughs> is they have a dedicated funding stream it's politically brilliant no pun intended haha -ha. they Sorry. well but they you know <laughs> the the fees you spend on on fishing licenses and gear generate money that's dedicated to those causes. So we, pr oh. we prob sorry, we probably have too many hatcheries, um, <laughs> but they are paid for by the people who benefit by them. And yeah, so it's politically, they don't even appear on the budget. It's very clever. Huh, that is really interesting. I did not know that at all. Um, so yeah, maybe that's what happened. More people bought like waiters or something. <laughs> and, like that's why Well, the, the hatchery <laughs> movement is fascinating because it, it's entirely, serving the recreational interests and for a while i mean in the 60s they were there was really this notion that some species were desirable and some were not and the and the blm was actually going in and killing fish in in rivers to get rid of undesirable species so then they could put in the desirable species there's some famous examples in the 60s of that uh, that are just shocking where they actually ever... pour poison into the river to kill no, fish really Yes, to get rid of the undesirable species so that they can then plant the ones that people want to catch. That's completely bonkers. I, I have done, I've done something much more eco-friendly, which is that I've gone to, I've tagged fish. And like, oh, that's, oh, like wow. I've never done that, which is really cool. I did that yeah. also when I was a kid. But um, where we like went with like, you know, they run in an electrical pulse through the, the water and it stuns yeah. all of the yeah. fish and they float to the top like and then this. you tag them. What? <laughs> yeah, no, they do. They just kind of like go belly up and they're totally fine. They're just like shocked and they float to the top and you tag them. And this is the coolest thing. Um, That's what the... we do to the audience. <laughs> we zap them and then they float up onto the screen. <laughs> I had completely forgotten that until just now. Um, but anyways, so yeah, totally different topic. 
uh, from the stuff that you previously covered. But I'm also kind of interested in how you started working on uh, child abuse and yeah. kind of your, so I was reading your page and I was kind of struck by like the exact wording of how you summarize it on your page, which is the social and legal ramifications. And of course you wrote your book um, about like the, the, the witch hunts. Yeah. And um, I have, I, I don't, I don't know. I've done a lot of kind of work about the social and social norm violation enforcement uh, through shaming and ostracization and things like that. And of course the paradigmatic example is like Hester Prynne or like kind of the witch hunts um, or things like that from like Salem. So I'm just kind of curious yeah. to tell us more about your book and kind of how you started studying that. Yeah. Gee. Um, my book began in the nineties, I would say, uh, you know, my book, <laughs> um, and it, you know, it's not a secret. It came, I mean, this came out of a personal trauma and this really came out of, something that ha sort of came back to me as an adult. And then I went, I sued the San Francisco boys chorus in 1992, um, which I was way ahead of my time. And, and, and I had been abused at their summer camp and I did a whole investigation and pr showed there were other people and the camp knew. And so they ultimately like apologized to me. Um, and I wanted to, and, and part of the, when the boys chorus answered the legal papers, they attached like this New Yorker article that seemed to have nothing to do with my case or anything that was about, you know, a crazy case in the state of Washington called Paul Ingram. So this was my introduction to sort of, you know, the false memory syndrome foundation and people that that we're arguing that we have be that we've become hysterical about the sexual abuse of children in this country that there's hysteria so uh, richard gardner a guy who's now deceased but was connected vaguely to columbia as a psychiatrist he wrote something he wrote an op-ed in the wall street journal called sex abuse hysteria this was 1995 and he said, we've become so hysterical in this country about sexual abuse that child molesters, on average, have longer sentences than murderers. And I thought, well, that just can't possibly be true. That just struck me as beyond Wall Street Journal, Wall Street right? Journal is not that great at fact-checking their op-eds in my limited... Right. <laughs> so like, so um, I, I contacted him and I said, what's your source for that? You said, on average. And he writes back and he says, um, I can't find my source, but let me tell you about a guy who got a really long sentence. And he told me about like one case that I knew about of a guy who got a 300 year sentence. So I then did the longest, I did the most comprehensive study comparing murder and child molestation. I took all of the cases in Rhode Island over, I think, 11 year period and compared them. And he was off by at least a factor of 200. Maybe more, depending on how you how you calculate things like life without parole. That's the best thing that I've ever heard come out of a Wall Street Journal op-ed. It was honestly. well, you know. <laughs> so, but I wanted. I he was like he made an empirical claim, and I could engage that claim. So then I'm saying to myself, how how is it that someone could think that that's true, and how could the Wall Street Journal think that that's true, and not just a you know? So I got into this world of people who say that we're hysterical and have engaged in witch hunts. So the next one was that Debbie Nathan, a freelance writer, and Michael Snedeker, a defense lawyer, wrote a book in 95 called Satan's Silence, Ritual Abuse and the Making of an American Witch Hunt. And they said, you know, where well, there have been witch hunts all over the country. And their book was dedicated to about 50 people that they said were still in prison, falsely convicted of the sexual abuse of children. And it looked really persuasive because the front of the book said, you know, Robert Halsey, Lanesboro, Massachusetts. And each person had, you know, a middle initial and a place name. So the first thing I did, I was going to write a review of that book. And the first thing I did was, because not all the names in the front even rang a bell to me. So the first thing I did was look in the back of the book for where all these people that they dedicated their book to were discussed in the book. And I realized that about half of them were never discussed in the book. And I thought, well, that's very odd. If you think that there's 52 people falsely convicted in prison and you've got their names, why aren't they at least 
mentioned in your book about this phenomenon. So the first thing I did was start doing trial court research into those cases. And the first one was Robert Halsey. It was closest to me. It was in Lanesboro, Massachusetts. And I sent a, an undergraduate up there to read the transcript. And I could still remember when she called and said, I can't imagine why anyone thinks this guy's innocent. You know, and I said, well, take good notes, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so then I wrote an article called The Legend of Robert Halsey that traced sort of how he ended up on, on several witch hunt websites and how the, how the actual transcript in the case in no way bore out any notion that this man was falsely accused or falsely convicted. And then I just started working my way down the list. I mean, I guess I, at some point I realized I was writing a book. And at some point, I knew I had to do this damn McMartin preschool case, <laughs> the longest case, the longest, you know, criminal trial in American history. Uh, it's a disastrous case, but it also has never been accurately portrayed by anyone, I think. It first was portrayed as the largest sexual abuse case in history. It clearly wasn't that. But then it was portrayed as it was all a witch hunt, and it wasn't that either. And I spent, I, I don't know, years going through the trial transcript. Um, and so my the first chapter in the book is just McMartin, and it documents with great detail the evidence against Ray Bucky. And so what are your broad conclusions? I mean, one of the other components, there's the, the child, the, the McMartin's case is really about, as I recall, you know, the the concern about it was leading children to yeah. make accusations but there are also these cases that uh people have gotten concerned about about recovered memories of sexual abuse um uh is your is the is the basic contention that you're advancing that there's really not a problem with um with sort of, you know, most people who were, you know, credibly accused of child sexual abuse really are guilty of it? Or is there, is there some, is there some problem that people have overstated with, uh, you know, I don't, yeah. maybe not witch hunting, but with, um, you know, with, with false accusations in this space? Yeah. Um, I think those cases from that time period are really complicated. They're what time really, period is that? Just really so quickly. They're between 85 and 92. Okay. And that's sort of the McMartin case starts at 83 and ends in 92. And then there's all these other- I'm not familiar with the McMartin case. So Sorry? if you don't mind, I'm not familiar with the McMartin case. So if you don't mind really quickly, like, okay. if, like, Summing yeah. it up, but if that's too much, then no, like, I'll tell you. No, and it, you know, I have a Google alert for it. You wouldn't believe how often it gets mentioned. It comes up I all the time. I've missed it. I don't. Well, I, it, yeah, you know, it's the it is the longest criminal trial in American history. So it begins in 1983, when a woman takes her kid to the doctor and says that he has um, blood in his anus, and she th this kid then goes to three different specialists and one of them really says he's been anally penetrated within the last two weeks. Uh, and that causes the beginning of an investigation. And the investigation is botched. I mean, they immediately send a letter to all the parents who've gone to this place and say things that you shouldn't say in a letter like that. Um, but Ben, the interesting thing about the leading children, you know, the, the, most people say that all the crazy things the kids said in McMartin came from the interviewers. Well, I'm the, I think the only person who's ever gotten access to some of those interviews. I have, I have eight of them in videotape. Um, and it's just not true. It's like the children are saying strange things and it's not coming from leading questions. They came into those interviews with those things in their head. So I'm not saying those things are correct, but I'm saying it did not, Key McFarlane is not the source of all the problems in that case. But anyway, it sounds like... But so, so, Kate, so, just it, a... so Kate, it starts with allegations against one person at a daycare center. Then the incredible thing is months go by, no one is charged, and then there's all of this over-the-top 
sensationalist media coverage by Wayne Satz on WABC in Los Angeles or KABC. And it's to look at this coverage in retrospect before anyone's been charged. No lawyer would ever let a, a news station essentially accuse people of being child molesters who haven't been charged. And there was this really over the top notion that kids were being abused at the McMartin preschool and no one had been charged. And night after night, and the pressure on that DA. So eventually, they charge Ray Bucky and five other teachers, all women. And I don't think any of those people should have been charged. And my book goes into like how it happened. And they don't ultimately go to trial. Those people get dropped after the preliminary hearing. Um, the trial goes ahead against Ray Bucky and his mother. And at the end of the trial, there's a hung jury on the mother. And there's a hung jury on some charges against Ray. He gets retried. And they're still hung on all three charges. So it was actually kind of inconclusive. but. Um, David Shaw won a Pulitzer Prize for criticizing his own newspaper's coverage, the, the Los Angeles Times. He wrote a sort of a four-part thing right when McMartin ended that said the problem was the press coverage, and the press didn't light a match within a half a mile of the prosecutor's feet, you know, and they're right. The, 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 the media coverage was very uh, pro-prosecution. But then the media coverage became entirely pro-defense. Um, and so the, what my book says after you know, 90 pages about this case is there was really credible evidence against one person, and there were five people that should never have been charged. So if you need to have only one story, the one story is this was a case that involved a lot of false allegations. But why does the story have to not include the evidence against Ray Bucky? You know, uh, and that's what I say is like it can't, it didn't come out of nowhere, and there's been a real minimization and denial of the evidence against Ray Bucky. And I think that's huh. for sort of political reasons. It's an agenda of people who want to, who, who are then making an argument about how suggestible children are. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. So interesting. I know. I like, so th now I'm going to read your book. I, I didn't even know about this. I have. I, I, to the opposite, um, what do you make of, so here's a kind of a hard question, like yeah. as an empiricist, as someone who, do, like, like one of the things, I clerked in the Eastern District of New York, um, in which the, the recently, um, recently passed away, I think this fall, um, Jack Weinstein, oh, yeah. who was a very old judge in the district court who really challenged the, what he saw as draconian based on junk science sentencing guidelines for sex offenders mm, yeah. um and one of the pieces of junk science that he that like that is frequently discussed in this um in this kind of debate is that the basically there isn't a lot that there was one study i think in like 1983 that cites to a bunch of kind of crappy social science research from like the 70s something i forget the exact chain of events but i looked it up at one point and the, but basically, it's it's not actually a particularly good sample size, and it's not it's only one study, and a court cited to it once, and then like it has been the like the here we have facts to show that there is a high high likelihood of recidivism among people who have sexually offended, and because of the high rate of recidivism, there should be very high there should be loath to to put people out on parole, and there should be very long sentences. Um, I have some sympathy for, for that if it's based on junk science. On the other hand, of course, if it's not, like that seems like a very large risk to take. Um, I'm just kind of curious, like what your thoughts on something like that are. Yeah. Um, well, I think we do. I mean, first you were in federal court, right? Yes, it was federal. It, sorry, yeah, that, and it's like, you know, it most... changes things a lot. Right, and most of the sex offenders are in state court, you know, yes, in my sentencing are. study, two thirds of the people guilty on second degree child molestation did no time at all. None, Completely. zero. Completely. Yeah, yeah you know, Completely. so in some way, when I looked at the system at the state level as a whole, I thought this is a pretty lenient system. Um, that, that said, was, it doesn't that mean was, that there aren't people that we throw the book at. Um, and that I, and was my conclusion about the sextortion cases I studied too, by the way, which was that the federal system, 
because of the child porn laws, people would go away for a long time. Yes. But yeah. the state system, by the way, particularly in Rhode Island, was unbelievably lenient. And wow, the, I had no idea there was such a delta between um, between state and I mean, I knew there was one, but I didn't know. But that, Kate, yes, I'm, I'm going to caution you on one thing, which is, yeah, the recidivism rate is not the same thing as the getting caught rate. A wonderful point. Right. Actually, I know. And I would make the same point to anyone who would be. Right. Studying I mean, that, so right? this that is the is, problem. Yes, I think it's a great point. Right. The problem is this is a crime that's about secrecy. So it's all about secrecy. So of course the getting caught rate is lower. That doesn't mean that the incidence base rate of recidivism is lower. Yeah, it just means you get better at not getting caught. Right, but I do think <laughs> that right I, now, and I, I can also uh, add this fascinating. I spent 15 years um, teaching at the prison in the sex offender treatment program in Rhode Island. And I did it because I wanted to better understand these guys. Um, and I ended up thinking that the, the program was meaningful and I wanted to make some contribution to it. So in that context, I saw a lot of people who had very, had shorter sentences than they should. And who were the two people who had really long sentences? They were both black, you know? And yet it's a very white population, so stunningly white for the prison. But you know, the same disparities that you see other places. Um, it's the other thing I would say, point. you didn't quite ask about this, Kate, but Megan's yep. Law is another place that we throw the book. Un oh, it's sort of like we have these identified sex offenders and we use that to throw the book at them after they're done. And it's counterproductive. It's something that put people score political points off of. Um, and nobody in the world of sex offenders thinks it's a good idea. It's such an it's such a great point. Um, I think that that is so the scoring of political points is like, I think kind of maybe one of you can't say it, but I experience this because I do se like sex exploitation and CSAM yeah. work and uh, and stuff on Section two thirty and people um, people use Section two thirty like as if it's some type of get out of jail free card for people who do this type of stuff when it actually it's not because like all criminal law is like accepted from that type of thing. And there is, I don't know. It's just, it is like, it is a really, it's a, it's kind of a really weird way. I, weird is like putting it mildly, but it's a very, it's a very disheartening. And I feel like it's a very, um, it's like the worst part of, uh, of politics to watch. Well, I'll, I'll put that too fine a point on it. Yeah. Laws, <laughs> laws named after dead children are generally a really bad idea. You know, they're passed way too Less. quickly, way too without, you know, you can't criticize them. They're, you know, and bad things happen with Jessica's law and Megan's law. And, you know, it's a it's a really bad political phenomenon. Yeah. You pass a law to honor the dead child and probably do something with, that's not a good idea. Um, Radley Belko, someone remind Mickey reminds us in the chat, who is a, an ex a friend and an excellent um, columnist uh, in, for the Washington Post, says yes. just about every law with a name turns out to be a bad policy, <laughs> and I think that that's maybe true. I like, I mean, it, I think that you're right. I think that there yeah. it is like it's almost entirely for points. David Botts, you have an excellent question about R. Kelly um, for Professor Tite. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you so much, Professor Chait. Um, do you have thoughts about the conviction of R. Kelly and what does what does the conviction that we saw today versus his previous ongoing acts for years tell us about how society treats the rich and famous versus the not rich and the or not rich famous. and famous and black? Yeah, right. And black. I, I, you know, I have not followed R. Kelly's trial closely, although I was fascinated to read that there are chat rooms of people dissecting testimony, that there are real people are diving into this case online uh, in a way that I didn't know, uh, pro and con. Um, but I guess I do feel like this is a case that um, should have should have been resolved years ago. You know, he was tried years ago and acquitted. Um, and I guess that the fact that he was now convicted at least suggests some movement forward. Um, but I think the people that have raised the question of sort of black 
victims just don't get anywhere near the attention as white victims um, is totally true. And I often get asked about the Catholic Church cases, and those are generally they're white and they're male. And male, you know, people don't ask a male, well, what were you wearing? You know, people don't ask a male, did you do something to, to, to make the priest do that? You know, there's a way in which we believe. I like to say that's the 25-year-old firefighter from South Boston. People believe him when he says the priest did that. Um, but if he was black or if he was saying it when he was a kid, maybe not. Yeah, I mean, I'll also just add to that the, like, just in light of that this is, like, yet another example of like white woman syndrome in the press and everything else. Meaning like, like the, uh, this Gabby P Petito yeah. story Petito. or whatever, that is just get like this outsized reaction of like $1.2 million spent on this search so far and all of yeah. this other stuff. And there's not even like, she's not, I mean, there's not even a question of searching for her. You're searching for the killer, right. which seems like a very targeted killing. It's not like he's a threat to, other, like, I don't know. There's just a crazy amount of stuff. And I'm just thinking, yeah. man, would any of this be happening if both of these people were like not on Instagram or not, or like, or black or like whatever it is, it just seems like such a sensationalized. And I just, I don't know, I guess my only, my last point before we call Paula up to ask her question is just kind of like, I really wish that there was, I wish we would start getting better about this. I feel like there has been enough discussion at this point, at least 20 years. And social media is like coming out now that we should be getting, there should be some collective amount of like, like newspapers deciding not to cover it. And I've noticed the New York Times so, has not this, covered but, it. But hang on, this is really a, a really hard issue because this is an example of the mass public sucking, right? <laughs> and. You know, you, you, you can attribute it to media and there's a certain amount of legitimacy to that, though it doesn't tend to be elite papers like the New York Times. It tends to be television media. Right? Completely. You go, you go ape over the missing white girl. Um, uh, and in fact, for those of you who've never listened to The Onion's fabulous send up of uh, the serial series, um, called a very fatal murder. Um, the, uh, the opening of it actually says this story had everything, and then it lists the elements that it had, and the last of them is and a really hot dead white chick. Um, oh, you know, and like so, like people have been parodying this for a long time, and but here's the problem. Uh, when the press or the, the it's really the television media does this shit, the, it is in fact generating a huge response among ordinary people. Um, and people love this stuff and everybody wants the media to behave more responsibly. But th that is not what an economist would call their revealed preferences. <laughs> um, and... Um, and I think we actually have to have a conversation with ourselves about, like, you know, bad television will give us exactly what we want. Uh, and sometimes that's The Bachelorette, and it's kind of harmless. And sometimes it's this stuff, and it's pretty harmful. But I think we have to think about the consumer side of it as well as just criticizing the media. But my point only is only been that, like, that exact argument with the me with like that we expect the media to be paternalistic on our behalf is the exact same thing that we're screaming at social media to do even though they have the exact same like economic incentive stru structures <laughs> like right of like bringing giving people what they want so they watch and bringing them in more but we're like not mad at the media for it we're just mad at social media for it and i just think that's kind of the thing the i agree social look social media gets a little bit too much criticism because in fact what it's reflecting is us and there at some point we have to confront the fact that we suck you know yeah. and and there are various like there there's a cultural problem that we have that is has many technological expressions but we shouldn't uh, over 
we shouldn't over blame the expressions by way of absolving ourselves of the of the basic responsibility. I have uh, put a link to a very fatal murder in the chat. You should all listen to it because it's the onion at its very, very best. Ben, I think there's a similar point about the food system, which is that the food system also gives us mostly what we want. And then we criticize it because it's giving us things that we want. You know, right. I just read that franchise book about McDonald's and I think she's a little too hard on McDonald's because I think McDonald's actually does provide things people want. Yeah, this is like kind of my, like this is kind of like, so the only thing that you could possibly do to this is like really get rid of capitalism because it's kind of yes. like, it's like yes. this is, that's the only solution to that. That, you know, whatever, that's a whole different podcast. Yes. Um, <laughs> Paula, speaking of food systems, bring us home with a great um, question about fish. Oh, good. Um, yeah, so I mean, to your point, I wonder if you think that food policy is too sensitive or personal of an issue for American politics, because I think that point is right. And as someone who's like really interested in nutrition, just from being an athlete, but a poli sci major and someone who's in law school, <laughs> I find that like the real, it's a real sentiment that prevents any policy from getting done. And if I could say one thing, like, if the right had any criticism of COVID policy, it's kind of that there was like no initiative taken by you know agencies to say, here's how you can get healthy before you get a vaccine. But then again, I think if an agency went on TV and told people to like work out and eat healthy or like create some food policy, um, people would be like lined up with pickets in the streets. <laughs> So I just think there is some weird American thing about food policy, and I'm not sure what it is. Well, there there is. I, as you were talking, I was thinking in my ethics class, I used to use do this case about laetrile. Do you know what laetrile is? It's, you know, it's, it's made I from, remember the it's made from apricot pits. And, and shark cartilage. And it's not approved by the FDA. And there are people who want to use it because it's not approved by the FDA. Like and ivermectin. That's why they that's kind of seals it for them. If the FDA says I can't use it, then I want it. But, but the other thing I'm thinking when you asked your question is I'm thinking a lot from my book about these dietary guidelines that the US puts out every five years. Because every five years they say you should eat a lot more fish. And every five years we don't do it. You know, and it's really the government's constantly telling people that they should eat more fish and they don't actually say eat less red meat because you're not allowed to say it that explicitly. But they say things that add up to that. And yet diet doesn't change at all. So it yeah, may I mean, be that government can't can't and probably shouldn't try to change what people eat. Well, I think that that, that reminds me very much of the Elena Kagan's confirmation, uh, confirmation question. Did you remember this of like, can like what like should like should we like can we can we create a law to make people eat broccoli or something and she was like we can make a law <laughs> like we shouldn't make a law <laughs> like and you know i think that this is like kind of uh and i feel as a law professor i spend half of my life especially in one else doing the uh is this illegal well like or like can i or even better i should say can i sue someone for this like you could always sue someone for right. something. Yeah, the like, answer to that question is yeah, always no, yes. Always yes. Right. Always yes. Being successful is a completely different. Will you win? Like, or should you? Like, no. Like, pro you know, th those are things that are like different types of uh, metrics. But um, yeah, well, I have to ask, do you try to eat more fish? Or do you eat a lot of fish in your I diet? I eat a lot of fish. I, we, yeah. we really do. We we get fish delivered. We have fish at the at the farmer's market. We really take advantage. Um, although here's my, you know, one thing I've learned, the local calamari that is caught off of Rhode Island and is sold as local goes mm -hmm. to China to be um, processed. Well, you know, what's really funny that Alaska does, like not Alaska does that too, to Russia. Did you know that? Yeah, a lot of a lot of Alaska's food, uh, like a lot of Alaska's fish processing happens in either Washington State, right. it goes all the way to Washington, or it goes to it goes overseas. Or it's squid is overseas. so low value. I know, it's so low value that the idea that it's worth it to send it all the way to China just to grade it is just amazing to me. Yeah, 
Yeah, it tells you how cheap shipping is right now. Yeah, right. It also, t- yeah, it also tells you. Sorry, go ahead, Ben. What were you gonna say? No, I was gonna say that it, it's no crazier than to me than the you know importing buttons manufactured in China, um, right? I mean, think about the the lowest value items you consume. Yeah. Um, are likely to be made the farthest away from you in the world. Yeah. And why should that be different with a squid? Okay. Well, I mean, like, if they were catching them in China and then processing, but the, the the back and the forth, like, and then sending it back to Rhode Island, that seems like a little, it's like the world's like most expensive food processor. Uh, like, but um, yeah, that's, I think that that's, that's a, also, I will say, I, I highly endorse, a good Rhode Island calamari for the, for, cause like with the, it has garlic and it has, um, banana peppers on it. Mm-hmm. And it is just, and it and is it's like the state appetizer. It is so damn good. And it's, it's officially the it. state like, appetizer. Really? Yes. That's so cool. I love it. So every time I'm, every time I come through Rhode Island, I get it. It's so good. What, what, um, what is, what is the state, uh, 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 you know, post dinner cordial. <laughs> Gee, I'm not sure I, I know. Think, yeah, I know. I know. I wonder. You've if stumped me. I know. I, I, you could make one. It's probably something to do with coffee milk. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, Ross, it was so great to have you on the show today. This has been like a really wonderful, sprawling conversation that I actually can now see the connection between these two topics. Oh, and, good. And like, and like why you're, you know, why you're driven in, in all of them. I think that your work is so important in both of them and evidence-based, uh, evidence-based research in any industry or in any area of harm is so, so, so important as we kind of create laws and we react socially to things. So I just, um, bravo. It seems like, it seems like I can't wait to read your, your book on fish. Come back on when you've written it. Well, um, thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Um, I hope we get you to Brown at some point. And Ben, it's absolute pleasure. I may have to send you some things about fish now that I know you've written op-eds about it. I, I used to write the Washington Post's fisheries editorial, which were not frequent. But uh, <laughs> it's still. You know, if, you, if you find one between the years 1998 and 2006, it was I'm gonna look. written by me. I'm going to look. We will be back tomorrow. Don't know who the guest is going to be. It's going to, something's going to materialize. That's uh, what always happens. You are a great American. It was fabulous to meet you. And we will be back tomorrow, 22 hours and 58 minutes from now. I will not have written 100 miles on a bicycle between now and then. But until then, Kate, We don't have fun anymore, but we are allowed to have fish and I am really hungry and I'm going to go take my pickle juice and I'm going to go find something. I I have to remind (laughs) you all of something because I was listening to one of the back episodes of the podcast back from the early days of In Lieu of Fun and the sign off has changed. Really? Uh, Yeah. In the early. So we now say. We're not allowed to have fun anymore, but uh, in lieu of fun, we are, and we make up something specific to the episode, but it used to be, we're not, every day, we're not allowed to have fun anymore, but in lieu of fun, you can come hang out with us. Oh yeah, I do remember that. I forgot <laughs> that we used to say that. So yeah, I just want to- people were all just hanging out at home. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so in lieu of fun tomorrow, come hang out with us, people. Ross, it was great to meet you. Thank you. Bye, Ross. Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure.